You are listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Films. For more, visit our website at www.megiddofilms.org. Good everybody, welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 4th of June, 2016. Thank you all for tuning in. This is now show number 200. Hard to believe five years later. The first show of Megiddo Radio was recorded on May the 28th, 2011. That was last Saturday. And now, by the grace of God, we are on show number 200. It's hard to believe. Time flies. And uh, I pray by the gr- grace of God, anybody who's been listening for quite a long time, will have been blessed by any of the podcast, broadcast, whatever you want to call it, radio shows that have gone out over the last five years have been a blessing to people. I pray that that has been what they're for. I mean, often when people start radio shows or YouTube channels or whatever they that may be, things can start off in a certain way and get distracted in another way. I, I kind of want, by the grace of God to use this not to I suppose there's always dangers and anybody who's thinking about getting into podcasting or doing radio shows or anything else like that make sure your motives are right before you even start and um, and make sure you are ready to do the research and things like that I mean but I digress Um, show number 200 here we are 4th of June, 2016, and Lord willing, we'll be able to do another 100 or how many more that the Lord will enable us. Also, slight change in in people have I noticed over the last few weeks, there's been Saturday night shows like like normal, and also there have been a number of Monday night, and I'm hoping to continue that. I've rearranged certain things in my schedule, same amount of work, well, a bit more work to be honest, but not too much more. I want, I wanted to be able to get out to see if it was possible to get out two radio shows and trying to maximize the content basically, and so far it's working. And uh, please keep that in your prayers. That be able to continue that, and uh, hopefully nothing will suffer. I have to make sure before I do these shows in the first place that the research is done, things like that, and um. On today's show, we're going to be talking about homosexuality and the Bible. Not something we have covered, well, we have covered a lot in this show. Um, I think one of the first shows I did on homosexuality on the show, I've talked about it briefly, but never actually dedicated a whole show to, towards the subject. I think it was back in 2014. Vicky Beeching, a CCM artist, came out as a lesbian. She's normally on UK television. She's in the Church of England, if I'm not mistaken. And she is, quote-unquote, a theologian. And I think she studied at Oxford. Anyway, she came out about two years ago. Was big in the CCM, Christian contemporary music world. And I covered that and talked about that. And um, I've been talking about various issues here and there. But the the advance of the LGBT movement isn't just out in the world, beyond the, the boundaries of the professing church. It is happening within the professing church. And yet another, quote-unquote, Christian rock star, I won't even comment about the whole rock star thing. I mean, rock music as a lifestyle, as a death style, I, I know for myself. W- w- just a brief comment on it that... W- When I was involved in rock music, when I was involved in metal music, I knew it was of the devil. I knew. And we got, I remember when we were in rock and metal bands, at least I did anyway, I used to get really annoyed when the Christians used to take our music and co-opt it and change it and things like that. There's a dozen quotations back in the 60s and 70s, early rock musicians were saying, no, this is the devil's music. And that was the title of it. Rock music was always known as the devil's music. But anyway... That's not kind of what I want to get into here. A CCM artist by the name of Trey Pearson. Never heard of him before. And I don't think he's that 
quote unquote famous. He has gotten into the Billboard charts 200, and obviously he's made a career for himself in the CCM world. He has recently come out as homosexual. The sad thing is, Trey, well, it's not the only sad thing. Any, any sin and bondage to sin is sad, but he is married with two children, which makes this story even more Tragic. I came across a story a few days ago. It was it was written about in Charisma magazine. But the Washington Post published an article about this. Quote, I never wanted to be gay, unquote. Christian mis- Christian musician comes out in moving letter to fans. This article was written by Julie Zwasmer for the Washington Post, and she's a religious writer. And she writes, and I'm just going to quote from Trey Pearson's own statements and comment on them, and let's ask the question, from the scriptures, is it possible to be a homosexual and to be a Christian? to be a practicing homosexual, to, to identify yourself as a homosexual and be a Christian. Before, I'm just going to come, for this show, I like I'm, every time I deal with the same topics, I've dealt with homosexuality before plenty of times, a good number of times anyway, I can't remember how many. I try to cover things from different angles and this time I'm not going to, sometimes I get into rants even before I get into the video clip or read, I'm just going to read his statement. And is this consistent of someone? Is this a credible profession of faith of someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ? Is this someone who's been truly regenerated by the Spirit of God? In his... I shall go to the original... In his statement to fans, Trey writes, To my fans and friends, most of us reach at least one pivotal moment in our lives that better defines who we are. These last several months have been the hardest, but have also ended up being the most freeing months of my life. To make an extremely long story short, I have, I have come to be able to admit to myself and to my family that I am gay. And this is the premise again. You just are gay. You can't do anything about it. Um, we could get into other things, you know, following that logic. People can self-identify with whatever behavior they are and be whatever they want to be. But... Th- He says, I grew up in a very Christian, a very conservative Christian home where I was taught that my sexual orientation was a matter of choice and had put all my faith into that. I don't like the way it's kind of put, you know, you choose to be gay, you choose to be straight. That's not the way the Bible puts it. Adam in the Garden of Eden was the federal head of all mankind. This is talked about in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. Christ then being the second Adam. But Adam represented all of mankind. He was given one positive law, which which is a summarization of the moral law, uh, kind of a, a test, you could say, of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But Adam, as we know, failed. He ate of the true tr- the tree of the, the he ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he broke the law of God. Now mankind is in bondage to sin. It's the doctrine of original sin. By natural by Natural propagate, uh, 
production of children, one generation to the next. Our sin, the sin nature of Adam is passed from one generation to the next. Also, the guilt of Adam's sin is imputed to our account. I say, well, how, how will that be? Well, it has to be because when Christ, if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and we turn from our sin, turn from our folly and our error, turn from our wretchedness and our sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then his perfect righteousness is imputed to our account. There is a substitution and no longer are, are we cursed from Adam's sin. So we are sinners for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. All of us sin. All of us are born in iniquity. All of us are evil from a babe, evil from our youth. We notice from Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. So we're all sinners. The way that sin and our wretched, evil, wicked heart shows itself is different in everybody. The way that looks. But everybody has sinned and are by nature sinners, criminals before God. They all are born, are conceived even, hating the light. And all need to be born again. As Jesus told the religious Pharisee Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So we all have the same problem. Rebellion against God and we are born because of our fallen nature we are naturally sinners does that make because i have a predilection towards stealing or i have or what any other sin stealing or say i'm married and i i lost after another woman or anything else like that does that make it right because it's quote-unquote, the way I am. This, is that the way the Bible presents it? No, Jesus says you must be born again. And that means to be baptized into Christ, being brought into union with Christ. And baptism signifies and seals the washing of your filth. As the water cleanses away the filth, so it, the blood of Christ does. It is confirm, confirming, it is a strengthening sign and seal, picturing the, how the blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sin. And we can trust in that. Now there's water baptism, which signifies and seal, but then there's spiritual baptism where those who've been regenerated, brought into union with Christ, those who now are in communion with Christ and walk not according to the, form, the former ways of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that defined them. Their sin defined them, but now obeying God defines the Christian. So we all have sinned, and just because we are pr predisposed towards whatever sin it might be, now, there's something extra, extremely grievous with homosexuality. It is against nature. And there's a special, what I believe, a special hatred for God in this. Which is described in Romans chapter 1. But look, notice how he says, I grew up in a very conservative Christian home where I was taught that my sexual orientation... I mean, Pete, what does that mean anymore? What is seen as conservative, probably 50 years ago, would be seen as liberal nowadays. Much of what is considered conservative is yesterday's liberalism. 
conservatism has moved more and more to the left. It's a meaningless term anymore. And sadly, he says he married a girl and has two little kids. I mean, the selfishness. He has made vows to love his wife. Love is an act of the will. You don't just kind of go, well, I'm not feeling it today. I'm not in the mood. I'm not going to love my wife. No, no. Out of acts of kindness, you love your wife. You're commanded to do so if you are a husband. We don't get to go, well, my sin is leading me in this direction, so I'm just lying to myself. What you are then doing is serving sin. And sadly, Trey, if you're, Lord willing, you're listening to this, or anybody else who's caught in the same lie, you are a servant of sin. You have not been created to rebel against the God of the universe. We are to glorify God in all that we do. And to violate his law, as is clearly written in his word, there's no positive, not one positive reference to homosexuality in the scriptures. And everywhere it talks about marriage or any kind of God-honoring union, it's between one man, one woman for life. Anything outside of that is an abomination. So I'm going to skip on a bit here. Um, he says, Then I thought everything would come naturally on my wedding night. I honestly had never even made... Mm, skip on a bit. Of course I feel anything but natural for me. Trying not to be gay has only led to a desire for intimacy with friendships which pushed friends away, and it has resulted in a marriage where I couldn't love satisfy my wife in a way that she needed. Still, I tried to convince myself that it was what God wanted and that this would work. I thought all those other feelings would stay away if I just do this right. And again, what you're following is your feelings, not God. Going to skip on a little bit here. When Lauren and I got married, I committed to loving her to the best of my ability, and I had the full intention of speak of spending the rest of my life with her. So what? You can't just, you know, there are only two times you can legitimately divorce in the scriptures. That is, if the other person abandons you, abandonment, We'll get into another show. Or, save for fornication, save for adultery. They're the only two, type, two times. If your spouse is in adultery, then that's grounds for divorce. But God still hates divorce. If at all possible, save your marriage. If you divorce somebody for any other reason besides that, then you're in sin and you cannot remarry. Now, if you are if you've done that and you are now remarried, you stay with that person. You know, the old the old cliche, two wrongs don't make it right. He also goes on to say, I've intensely mixed feelings about the changes that have resulted in my life. While I regret the way I was taught to handle this growing up, how much of this hurt me and an uh, and the unintentional pain I have brought Lauren, and I'm just going to skip on a bit, talks about beautiful children. But if I keep trying to push this down, I will end up hurting her even more. Oh, of course, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, again, don't pretend you are the victim here. Homosexual urges are vile affections. They're vile. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. How are we to view 
homosexuality is n- we're not to view it like the psychologist. We're not to rationalize it according to human wisdom. Yes, when someone is struggling with sin, we should sympathize with them and help them in any way. I'm talking about struggling with sin. But he is given in to his sin. Oh, this is who I am. This is it. Romans 124, therefore God, I'll just go from verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And this in the context is talking about people who've held the truth and the righteousness, Romans 118. Verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. This is the judgment of God. And what does the judgment of God look like? You see, even the reprobate, there is common grace restraining, even if you're outside of Christ, restraining you from being as evil as you could be. The Reformation taught total depravity, not absolute depravity. You're not as evil as you possibly could be, but you have the potential to be. There is common grace. Romans 126 says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves that recompense of the error which was met. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Men with men, women with with women. There was the death penalty in the old economy, the old dispensation in Israel. So, how can you think That this is possibly God's will. If you are consumed by sin and it defines you and you serve sin, you know not God. A person who's been regenerated by the Spirit of God, the characteristic fruit of their life is a life which honors and serves God. Not perfectly, of course, but there will be fruit. They will be different. They will loathe their sin. And if they have those kind of tendencies, they will loathe their homosexuality. Hate it. And they will never have peace as long as they accept it and just go, oh, well, this is just who I am. Because it is a sure sign that this man trade does not no God. Why do I say that? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 8 reads. Hebrews chapter 10. Or sorry, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 8. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he has received you, and you fall into sin, it will be miserable. I remember when I was first converted. Didn't know a lot. And I remember a few days after, I had a massive drinking problem. I loved to be drunk. But I remember a few days after, I 
bawled my eyes out, crying out to the Lord to, to be merciful to me, a wretched, vile sinner. What happened? I was drinking more than I should with, with friends at the time, and I, and I hated it. I didn't like it. And I was so clueless at the time, I didn't really fully understand the full depths, of the, I suppose, you know, as you grow in the Lord, you understand more the, the severity and the, how wrong sin is. But I didn't like it. My appetite, my desires were different. And of course, as a young Christian, you will struggle with various things, but you will hate it. You will want it in your life. You will want it out of there. But if God does not chastise you, you have not been accepted in the beloved. End of story. If you are a loving father, you will correct your child. And as much as you will do that, God the Father, if he has elected you and you have been regenerated and you're one of his and you've bowed the knee, through sovereign grace, by the power of the Spirit of God, applying Christ's benefits to your account and making you a new creature. If that is true of you, God will chastise you and cause you to walk in the narrow way. This is all of grace. This is the power of God. This is something that the modern church, sadly, because we believe, the modern church believes in, so much in the idol of free will, they make it about willpower, ultimately. And they can never quite decide if somebody's saved or not. But if you have such freedom, by living in sin, you know not God. Hmm, trying to decide where to go next. Matthew chapter 7. A place I've gone to years ago when I preached a message at Ard Reformed Baptist Church in Dublin. I preached on this. This is the first message I ever preached, actually. And it's a passage that I remember it scared me as a young Christian. And I couldn't really reconcile it to what I was being taught about carnal Christians. You could possibly be Christian and produce little or no fruit. But Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23 states... Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And you think, well, the rest of the Bible is stating clearly it's not of works, lest any man should boast. In places like Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. But it says, He, who doeth, he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Verse 22. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Have we not? So the defense before the throne of grace is to present their greatest deeds, the most righteous deeds, at least in their eyes. Which are, as according to Isaiah, I think it's like Isaiah 65, are but filthy rags. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Not, not that I once knew you and you apostatized and left. I never knew you. And that's a new, knew you in a saving way. How we foreknew before the foundation of the world, those who the, whom the Father has elected, those whom the Son died for, knew in a saving way. God cannot, this heresy of Arminianism, look down the corridors of time and learn by doing such a thing that, oh, this person will choose me and the other person will not. God does not learn anything. He knows everything. The reason he knows the future is because he has decreed the future. They go together. God does not react to anything. He has brought about whatsoever cometh to pass. Otherwise, he ceases to be God. Depart from me the work iniquity. And this is talking about the characteristic fruit. 
If your life is characterized by sin and you serve sin and that is what you are known for, that is that what defines your life, you know not God. But the person who's been regenerated, born again, they have new desires, new appetites, and they do not walk as they once did. It is... Modern Christianity, sadly, is like the like the Hindu, which has all their idols, sports, and whatever else, and they just add Jesus to it. We've we've tailored the modern church according to what the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Most churches now are like rock concerts. We've catered to the flesh so that even if somebody Ordinarily, in a in a godly church service where the word of God is preached, the sacraments are rightly administered, and there is singing of the psalms, and there's no kind of pumping music or anything like that in that environment, they would not feel comfortable. Sadly, in a church that is playing Hillsong music and all this kind of stuff, the reprobate would feel comfortable. This is a sad fact. And this environment, with doctrines like carnal Christianity, we're not... Calvinism is incredibly important here. And I'm not talking about what everything Calvin taught or anything like that, but the doctrines of grace. Because if we recognize... That a person, when regenerated by the power of God, and but for that mercy God shows upon them, they would just be as God-hating as they once were. And that there's a massive difference that they have been taken from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And they no longer serve their sin as they once did. They're no longer spiritual Lazaruses. They have been brought to life, just as Christ said, Lazarus, come forth. He says to a dead sinner, dead in trespass and sins, as in he, the doctrine of total inability, he's totally enabled, not because he is naturally enabled in the sense of physically or anything else, but he hates the light. He doesn't want to. He's incapable of turning to God because he doesn't want to. It's like... I think the best example I can give and an analogy is, you know, when you have a, a horrendous stench. I don't know, I'm trying to picture like something like a, a septic tank, you know, when you're you're having to pass by it or something is rotting, a dead animal or something, and it's repugnant to you. Well, a lost sinner, the person who is dead in trespasses and sins, hates the things of God and cannot turn cannot trust in the Savior because he hates that. His nature hates that. He loves his sin. He loves his sin so much, even if he intellectually might understand the gospel and things like that, unless he is actually turned. The word repentance, metanoia, a change of mind. But it's not just an mere knowledge or anything like that. Is it a change of the soul, a change of the will, a change of the desires? Imagine a blind man. Top lady gave this analogy in um, a history of Calvinism in cave, vindicating the Church of England and that it was Calvinistic when it began. The, he get, that just say you're blind and you have now been given your sight for the first time. There's no forcing involved here, but God opens the eyes of a sinner. And because of the beauties of Christ, he's now been made alive. He sees his sin. And because he's been made alive, he's no longer dead in trespass and sins. There's no forcing involved. He flees irresistibly. This is irresistible grace. This is the doctrine of irresistible grace. He flees irresistibly to Christ. Why? Because of the beauties and the perfections of Christ. If you had never seen a sunset in your life and you were blind your entire life and your eyes were opened, you wouldn't have to be forced to appreciate a sunset or a beautiful landscape or anything like that. You would just be in awe of it. And Christ is so much greater than any of these things, any of these analogies 
pitiful analogies that I could give. The person whose eyes have been opened falls to his knees and cries out, Abba, Father. And we know from Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it is a narrow way. And wide is the road to destruction. There's not one scriptural reference in this letter to f- fans and friends by Trey, I'm not forgetting, is Trey Pearson. Because nothing what he's doing is supported by the word of God and there's no indication the man knows God at all. He says, and he's free to live and just be a homosexual. To be defined by his sin. I was going to go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. But if you've been made a new creature in Christ, you no longer serve the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life as the characteristic fruit of your life. Yes, there is a struggle going on in your being. And this is talked about at the end of Romans chapter 7, at the end of the chapter. And I'll go to that in a second, just to show that there is a struggle within the true believer. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of his of sins. But look at it says, who hath del- delivered us from the power of darkness. We've been delivered from the power of darkness. You think there'll be something different? And hath translated us from the kingdom into the kingdom of his dear son. First Corinthians chapter six. This is where it gets even more explicit. Know ye not, verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, deceived. neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, you say, reading that, it's like, well, who can possibly meet to these standards? This is not talking about works righteousness. Our greatest deeds are but filthy rags. But look at verse 11. It says, But such were some of you. You were those things. But you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Are you a fornicator? Does that define your life? Be not deceived. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Are you an idolater? Does that define your life? Of course there is sin in the believer. But is that what defines you? Is that what drives you? Are you an adulterer? Are you effeminate? Are you abuser with self with mankind, which is another way of saying homosexual? Trey has, sadly... He is still one of these. He has not been washed. He has not been sanctified. He has not been justified in him, Lord Jesus. The way is narrow. And you say, well, well, who can possibly live up to the standards? And I know people will say, oh, this sounds like the legalism and all this kind of stuff. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. This doctrine is so important because it's talking about the gospel is the power of God, the power of God unto salvation. And we're denying the power of God in the salvation of sinners. We're just saying, well, outwardly they make a different profession. It's the heart that is the problem. Mark 7, 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile 
the man. The problem is from within. You cannot say, well, I am just this way, and there's nothing else I can do. Okay, I'm going to look at a, an article that was written in response to this. Michael Brown, Michael Brown, who writes for Charisma Magazine, and I've talked about him a good bit on this show. I've been trying to not talk about him for a while because I don't want to, I could say, make a hobby horse out of anybody, but he, he is very popular, and he's always putting out his views. He's taken seriously for some reason. I do not understand that. He's charismatic. He's dispensational. He's an Arminian. He's, and I'm talking about in Reformed Baptist circles. Yeah, he talks about, he's good on social issues, but so? I know lots of people who are good on social issues that are not Christians. And I'm not saying they hear that Michael Brown is not a Christian. I don't know. But it's just a bit, I'm just a bit concerned with his response. So he says, my heart really goes out to Trey Pearson. It says in a moving letter. He says his heart goes out to him, although his band is not very well known. His story gets lots of attention. Um, skip it. So he says, as he's opened up his heart with painful honesty, he's basically, okay, he's feeling sorry for him. Should we feel sorry for Trey Pearson? Anybody who struggles with it? Yes, but does he struggle with it? <laughs> he says, to the contrary, no. He is basically rejecting his family, his role in the family, his role to love and cherish his wife, to be the husband. What's going to happen with his family? He doesn't really go into it here. Hints that that might be over. He says about the relationship, I am now I am trying to figure out how to co-parent while being her friend and how to raise our children. Well, you have God's commandments. In Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 33. Now, you cannot do this in your own in your own strength. You need the power of God to be able to do these things. But this is sinful. He is openly rebelling against God. He just said, well, here's my sin. This is me. And ultimately, say, like, he doesn't care what the Word of God says. There is no justification here. He just says he's a Christian, but it doesn't obey the Word of God. That's not a credible profession of faith. So the person, you know, said, oh, I never wanted to be gay. I never wanted to be a car thief. I never want, how many people are in prison who say things like that? But they're still guilty. It's still wrong. So no, like, my heart, my heart goes out to his family. My heart goes out to his children, his wife. But we hear, my heart goes out to him, an unrepentant, hardened sinner who is, I presume, has heard the gospel. Lord willing, he has heard the gospel and has rejected it. He is not picking up his cross and following after Christ. He is not repentant of his sin. He's unrepentant. He is embracing his sin just as much as the car thief is saying, well, I'm a car thief, can't do anything about it. Here's my desires. I want to do that. He who commits sin is a servant of sin. So no, my heart does not go out to him. And this is the thing with Michael Brown's Arminianism. He always treats this in a way almost like a psychologist would. There, is no, there are no positive references to homosexuality but every time it is mentioned explicitly it is shown to be a great 
grievous abomination and wickedness. And when there is a civil law back in Israel, there was the death penalty for it. I'm not going to read all of Michael Brown's article, but he says, Michael Brown writes about Trey, he has found his identity in his romantic attractions and sexual desires rather than his relationship with God. But it's quite clear from his letter, he doesn't know God at all. He's shown no interest in it, and he's cast it off for his feelings. It's completely mystical Christianity. There's no indication that he's repented and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ naturally means to not trust your heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not in thine own understanding. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. One of my favorite verses in the scriptures. And he says, he has decided to personal fulfillment is more important than obedience to the Savior. Decided? It's not just some kind of decision. It's out of his heart. His heart has not been changed. I say, well, we can't know his heart. We shall know them by his fruits. By his fruits, you know. You can see. So... And the way Michael Brown has kind of described this is that this is a series of bad decisions that eventually led to this. But this is not real. Is this really a belief in perseverance of the saints? I'm not saying that Michael Brown is in any way reformed. He says, I don't know if he received serious ministry or counseling to help him get to the root of the same-sex attractions. Many have found great help and even transformation in doing, in doing so. I think there's a typo here. But either way, I do not want to trivialize his struggles for a moment. And I don't want to trivialize his struggles either. Has your heart been changed? Have you been regenerated? Have you cried out upon the Lord? Have you trusted in Him? If you have not, then can you have any confidence that you are truly born again? Every conversion is different, but there is one thing that is clear. If you go to any part of the scripture, John 15, for example, I am the vine, I'm the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. So it talks about bearing fruit, and if it doesn't bear fruit, purged away. Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in him. And I, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself... So in order to bear fruit, you must be in Christ, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done. Trey, here, another point I wanted to comment on. He says, I have the same heart. So I want to quote him directly here. I hope people will hear my heart. Will it, again, anybody knows the scriptures. Jeremiah 79, the heart is deceitfully wicked. I don't want... If somebody looked at my heart on, the, on a big screen, they would my best friend would run for me. My wicked heart is not my 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 claim before the throne. It is that I am trusting in the blood of the Lamb, looking unto Jesus, the Author and Finisher of our salvation. I hope with my people will hear my heart, and that I will still be loved. If we if, if people love you, Trey. They will tell you the truth. They will not flatter you with deception. 
I'm still the same guy. He don't deny that. He says, with the same heart, you want to love God, but you don't love God. You've shown by the characteristic fruit of your life, you've been given over to vile affections. Who wants to love God and love people with everything I have. This is the part of me I've come to uh, able to accept, and now it is part of me that you know as well I trust to help, uh, to love. I trust God to help love do the rest. Get a bit of mouthful at the end. Okay, so. Do, Trey, do you love God? John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Summarized in the Ten Commandments. You're not. You're rejecting the law of God. And this is why this is a gospel issue. Yes, sinners were saved by grace, still struggle with certain things. But if you openly reject it, if you say, I know the Bible says this, and it's very clear in certain issues, I know the Bible says this, but I reject it and I hold the truth and the righteousness. People like Matthew Vines and all these kind of other people, they hold the truth and righteousness, they hold it back, they, they hate it. They show that they don't love God. 15.10 states, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Again, there's nothing to indicate anywhere that he's a Christian. Actually, everything points towards the fact that he needs to be born again. He does not have a credible profession of faith. What? The, and Michael Brown's written on homosexuals for years. I'm going to go back to the Michael Brown article. He talks about his wife. He says, What I do know is that Jesus said, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Amen. Matthew 16, 24. And this often means denying the deepest, most fundamental desires in our lives. Saying no to the things that are most important to us, crucifying every day that raises his head in disobedience to God. And that is true in sanctification. There will be a struggle within the true believer. But if you're openly in defiance and, and you have gone out from among us because you were never of us, then that needs to be pointed out too. <laughs> there are two possibilities with somebody who... See, I don't know to what... I don't know, and I have to point this out. I don't know to what extent... Nobody does outside of God, to what level of error somebody can be in and still be saved. You know, they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't have all their ducks in a row in a lot of places. And yes, a true believer can, I believe, struggle with same-sex attraction at times. But just as I, for example, for the closest thing I can get, I've never had same-sex attraction, but the closest thing I can give is my struggles with pornography. Struggling for years, I was daily, I think, at one point. And I struggled with it for months after my conversion. The way I struggle with it now, you know, struggle with it is obviously, in a kind of a sense, in any man, I have to make a covenant with my eyes and make sure I do not look towards women who are not dressed well not to look towards things on Facebook, things like that. But here's the thing. I absolutely hate it now. Younger, when I was just converted, I may have still, you know, in, in weakness and stupidity and backsliding, I would have gone back to those websites. I don't know, maybe like for the first six months, maybe once a month or something like that, and felt horrible at the end of it. Seriously, I would be like, the chastisement, and this is what I'm talking about, a true believer, 
can backslide and does backslide at times, and it is miserable, and you never want to do it again. My, my problem in the early days was this. I was trusting too much in myself, and if you were struggling, friend, in this, and you're truly regenerated, and you hate this, and, and, and God is truly chastising you in this, and you want to have victory over certain sins, I'm not saying that you won't have struggles, but don't trust yourself at all. Not for one single second. Do what Joseph did when that woman was trying to, I was in, uh, tr trying to remember the uh, chapter in Genesis. Fleeing, flee fornication, run from it. Don't try to negotiate with it, as we sometimes do foolishly, run from it. But now, as I, by the grace of God, and of course, I have to be careful. But I hate it now, and as I grow in the Lord, I hate that sin of mine more and more. And, but you never, don't trust yourself. If you're online and that's causing you to stumble, well, stay off the internet. And what I did was, I was saved about, oh, I don't know, six months. And I, re I was reading my Bible all that time for six months. But I really got serious then. Started becoming, I was going to a, a church that preached against sin. And, and... I spent just started spending hours in the Word of God, just not trusting myself. Don't trust yourself at all, not for one single second. You are not strong enough. You'll never be strong enough this side of eternity. Flee fornication. Flee sin. Any flee temptation. Just stay away from it. Anything that call, as much as possible. Of course, we can't go into monasteries and completely avoid everything. But flee fornication. The Lord will always provide a way out. And of course we will be tempted because of our sinful flesh. I agree with certain things that Michael Brown has said in this article, but I've... I have worries, and I've, with other people as well, I've, that it's just, oh, it's a bit like... You know, you need to try harder almost. No, he might not say that in so many words. He also comments near the end of the article. But this is just the beginning of his wrong life choices. And given enough time, his views on other scriptural matters will most likely change. As doctrinal compromise will lead to more and more doctrinal compromise. He's treating him like he's saved. There's no indication that the man is saved, that the man knows God at all. Trey... If you are listening to this, or any other CCM artist, whether it be Ray Bulls or a Anthony Williams, Jennifer Knapp, Vicky Beeching, if you are an habitual sinner and that defines your life, just like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11 describes, you do not know God, be not deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You need an alien righteousness. You need the blood of Christ to wash you from all sin. That way you see, you say, I was a homosexual. I was a thief. Whatever you once were, I was, as I was, a fornicator. But I, by the blood of Christ, have been washed let us never diminish the power of God. May we trust in Him and Him alone. If you don't, I urge you, don't trust in your own understanding. Search the Scriptures. This is life or death. This is eternity. And people want to just make decisions based on feelings. Be not deceived. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you do not have the righteousness of Christ imputed to your account unless you are trusting in the Savior. And if you are trusting in the Savior, and if that root is planted, if you've been regenerated, made a new creature, there will be fruit. 
and people who have known you for a long time, as they did to me, will look at you. They will know you're different. People will see you're different. You will see you are different. How? You have different appetites. You will have different affections. Spend, if you are truly a born again child of God, spend time in the word. Feed your soul. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the truth. Make your calling and election sure. Grow in assurance. Making yourself trusting his promises even more. That you have more and more confidence in him. This has been Paul Flynn. May God bless you all.